and basically my role is um, I carry out health service modelling um, as part of the NIHR uh, ARC collaboration. And my role is to work directly with the NHS to try and tackle some of their problems um, that they have, uh, which we can solve using different um, advanced analytics and modeling and simulation techniques. So I've, I've been using R for about ooh, 10, 12 years now. Uh, kind of on and off throughout my work um, alongside using uh, Python and I started out using things like MATLAB um, but yeah uh, I'm going to kind of talk to you today about this transition that we can make from Excel to R and not so much about you know the benefits of using R but about how you actually go about making that transition from doing your everyday routine tasks and your analytics in Excel and how you translate that over into R. And the aim is to kind of get you comfortable with that process and actually how you start creating reusable scripts uh, to be able to use consistently and within your daily, um, you know, monthly work cycles. So I'm hoping that's what you're expecting. <laughs> and I hope that this is going to be useful. So, you know, by the end of the session, you're getting an idea of how you want to be um, actually um, generating your own uh, reproducible analysis scripts. So yes, so we're going to be looking at how to develop generic R scripts to replace the kind of manual Excel based analyses and looking at which types of tasks are kind of most appropriate for, for automation. So we're going to start by looking at how we identify Excel tasks for translation into R and then breaking down kind of the, uh, the different components that you'd normally do when conducting an analysis in Excel and kind of splitting that down to see, to, to understand the analysis process, because you've got to be able to understand the kind of generic aspects of, an, of analyses in order to be able to develop these generic R scripts. And hopefully today we'll give you a bit of a recipe for doing that. And then we're going to go into building our first uh, non-generic R script and then looking at how you then make your R script generic and reproducible. Um, and we'll conclude with some hints and tips. So when we're thinking about translating Excel tasks into R, it's all about getting these regular, regularly performed tasks. And it's about asking yourself three questions, I think. Um, you know, kind of this will give you a start for thinking about what types of tasks should I be translating from Excel into R? And so thinking about the regularity with it, which you're um, undertaking these tasks. We want to look at um, we want to look at how regularly do I carry out this task? You know, this you know is is it, is it actually worthwhile me spending say seven eight hours creating a generic script in order to conduct this task? Because if your um, if your task in Excel takes you, for example, three hours every month, then I'd say, yeah, definitely. Um, you should be looking to make that an automated task that can be done in five minutes using an R script, um, which you can just feed the data into and get the results out of. Um, if it's a task that you do once a year and it only takes you an hour to do, 
or you might do it a couple of times and it still only takes you an hour it's not worth your time to spend seven eight hours creating a generic script because the the actual uh, time equivalency isn't isn't worth it um but those tasks those regular weekly monthly reporting tasks those you know those that that's when you're starting to get a task that's regular enough to warrant creating a generic script in order for it to be done you know those are the first ones to tackle and you need to think about whether you're always conducting the same analysis um, or create transforming the data in the same way creating the same um, the same plots um, if if you're always doing the same type of analyses maybe with tiny small differences but pretty much always producing the same output data the same doing the same transformations on the data and creating the same plots then yeah that's probably a good candidate for um, translation into R and the third thing to think about is the shape of your data now it's really key to creating a generic script if your data when it is fed in always has the same number of columns um, it doesn't have to have the same number of rows because that's your instances but in terms of the shape of the data you should always be feeding in the same columns with the same headers um, because that kind of consistency is key to creating a generic R script. Our data needs to be of the same width, the same number of columns, or those same columns have to be identified. You need the same columns each time to be able to um, develop a generic script. Because the way that we identify col uh, the columns that we're using in R is by the name, or by the column number. Sorry to butt in. A uh, quick question. Does it matter if some of the columns are merged uh, and some aren't? Um, just the, uh, the CCG outcome indicator set, this would be wonderful for that. Unfortunately, sometimes the, uh, the structure of the file, they just have some randomly merged columns in there. Uh, and, and there's a minor bit of manipulation you got to do in Excel before moving ahead. But the yeah. column names are still the same, though the structure is mucked about. Would that be an issue? Well, it's whether you can, uh, you might want to consider doing some pre-processing in R. So if it always comes in as a merged column. No, they change. Sadly. It changes, <laughs> so <laughs> that's that's not not a helpful thing that they do. So it might be that you have two slightly different variations of your script, one for when there are merged columns, and one for when there aren't no. merged columns. Yeah, so that you can do that transformation, but you can choose whether to do that. Yeah. And we'll look at how you can um, to kind of add that that choice, that generic functionality into there. Thank you for that question, that was a good one. So regularity, regularity, the regularity of the task, the analyses and the data, that's your first consideration for identifying tasks for translation into Excel. So I'm just gonna open the floor a little bit and um, just see what kind of routine tasks is it that uh, that you undertake? Any any um, you know? Uh, feel feel free to just jump in and uh, uh, standardized rates. Oh yes, yep. So that's a good one. And how how often would you carry that out? Uh, I I I don't know it it. Um... Whenever people want an analysis, generally we'll do it by indirect or direct standardized rates if we're basing it off heads or source data, uh, just so we can compare regions again. So quite common. <laughs> <laughs> quite a common one. Right, fair enough. That's uh, sorry, I've just um, I've got a bit of a. Ooh, I'm just going to stop sharing a moment. 
I had a, a menu malfunction there. Apologies. Um, any others? Any other um, kind of offerings on the kind of routine tasks that you you under undertake? One of the things that uh, springs to my mind is the uh, regular analysis we have to do on um, statutory returns, so like RTT and DMO one, that kind of thing. Right. Okay. So, so these are um, kind of predetermined uh, outputs that you you are always sending the same output. Of, would that be correct? Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So. Would I be correct in thinking that there's kind of, you know, uh, kind of splitting this down a little bit, that there'll be external reporting, things which are um, data reporting that's sent off to um, central NHS or NHS digital. Um, and then there's internal things. And any um, kind of um, particularly internal regular reporting that anybody does that they think might this might be appropriate for dashboards sorry just performance dashboards um we've got a couple of multidisciplinary ones pulling stuff for community social and uh acute uh and the one to truck primary care and as well and um, there's a fair little bit of data wrangling from different sources but they all hold the same structure kind of consistently right. so that ah. seems to fit the bill Brilliant. Yes. Yeah. No, great example. Because um, particularly being able to bring data from different sources, um, you know, if you can, uh, there's some great stuff. And I, uh, I think there's uh, some, some workshops and talks around this, around uh, pipelines and interactions with different SQL databases. Um, so, yeah, being able to draw from multiple databases um and feed it in um but yeah if you're doing the same drawing the same data each time um it can save save you a lot of uh, uh a lot of uh, a lot time. of time okay so uh it, does anybody automate any of their analyses at the moment um and if so how do you do this I, I've got a couple of sort of pre-made shells um, with indexes and VLOOKUPs and, and like my standardized things pointing at that. So I just need to create a pivot table of the correct structure and then paste values into my shell, as it were, which then does the rest of it. Uh, right. but, but, but that's it. So just pre-made formulas, which I took the base data in and, and then this attacks it from the outside, as it were. Ah, nice example. Um, so there's still a fair amount of manual interaction that you have to do with the data. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A couple of people in the chat have said they use SSRS uh, K9. I'm not familiar with that. I also work with people who have automated using access databases and then done some work further work either before or after in Excel. Great. Yeah, so it can often be a lot of moving between different uh, databases, different pieces of software in order to get the data out initially, then transform it, and then conduct any analyses that's required, then output it. So there's quite a few stages and a fair amount of manual interaction. You know, um, I'm, I'm sure you'll all go, you know, this is a big, big amount of, of, of our work, probably spend an enormous amount of time um, undertaking these, these quite routine tasks and this routine reporting that needs to be done on an ongoing basis. So it's these regularly conducted tasks that we're looking for. Um, consistently shaped data extracts and consistent analyses that those are the prime candidates for um, translation into R um, and and to really you know that it becomes worthwhile to actually spend the time creating a generic script for so 
you know, I've just put a few bits down down here. Um, the trusts that I tend to work with, um, there are some great examples of what they've done in terms of their performance reporting and operational reporting um, and automating those processes and their board reports as well. There's um, a great example from Simon Wellesley Miller, who I believe is uh, doing a couple of talks at the conference. Um, where they have automated their board reporting. So all the analyses are undertaken within, uh, within R. It pulls the data from the SQL databases, performs the analysis, but then outputs the, uh, the analyses itself into a predetermined um, word template and just places the numbers where they need to be and inputs the graphs where they need to be. Um, so when you get up to kind of this uh, much, the, you can go as far as you want with the automation here. You can literally, um, all of those reports where you've got to go and manually paste in the numbers, that can be done away with. Um, and you know, uh, that I think is a, a good goal for um, using R. Um, in relation to this kind of regular reporting, routine reporting that needs to be done is getting it so that the reports that need to be produced can be automatically generated. So where do you start? What, um, what should be the first thing? I don't, don't mean that uh, you should be going in and uh, automating your board reports straight away and uh, interacting between getting the interactions between SQL, R and Word going, because yes, they, they might want to build up to that. Um, so choosing something simple, um, a simple task, uh, something that's well-defined and something that's useful, because a lot of this will be about convincing your managers that it's worthwhile you spending the time to create these generic R scripts in order to be able to uh, simplify the reporting and to show that it can work. Um, you know, demonstrating early that um, technology like R can work is and work well for them and really, you know, and save you time um, is about doing something useful in the first instance so a regular something that you're regularly doing that does take a fair amount of time but is simple enough to be um, easily translated into R without too much hard work um, because because they don't want um, obviously your managers won't want you spending lots and lots of time um, writing R script initially without being able to see the benefit of that so simple, useful, and well-defined um, analyses are what you'd be, be looking at. So um, I'm just going to pause there a moment. Uh, do we have any, um, any questions at the moment at all, Zoe? No, I think uh, I'll take that as all good. Are the slides for this uh, available in the same source as all the others? Yes, yes. The uh, the Bam. slides you'll find in the Git repository, um, along with everything else. Yes. Great. So. So okay, I kind of talked about the types of tasks that you want to think about, um, kind of translating in from Excel into R. Um, now, what we want to do is have a look at, let's have a look at how this is done. Um, and we're going to start by looking at how you might break down an analysis, um, an analysis task. So today's scenario that we're going to work with is you're an analyst in a healthcare organisation. And every month you have to produce a report on the number of patients on the waiting list for service X and the patient waiting times for the two teams that provide service X. Your data extract contains the ID, age, referral date, 
the treatment date and the name of the team to which the patient has been referred. You know there are data, always data quality issues, so you have to check for duplications, missing data and incorrectly entered data. The report you have to build requires you to produce descriptive statistics tables and a series of graphs at different levels of detail for the last two years. Uh, you're producing um, overall patient numbers, overall wait times, frequency of wait times, comparison of overall wait times by team, monthly comparison of wait times by team, and monthly comparison of patient numbers by team. So what I'd like you to do is go away and write a script for this. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. Please don't panic. <laughs> um, so let's have a, what, what are the different stages of the analysis process that you think that we might be looking at here? You know, what, what are we looking to break down um, and extract from this description of our analysis in order to be able to translate that into an actual analysis process. What kind of things are we wanting to pick out here, do you think? You know, for example. The service type, uh, the wait time and the team and the date. Yes, certainly. One of the key things here, so yeah, we've got and age. We've got, we got our data. We got our data description. Absolutely. Um, so we know what our data should look like. But there are. So there's known data quality issues. Um, so that's data. Your data pre-processing and data cleansing. Then there's things that we want to look at here. So for example, our, we're gonna to have to produce descriptive statistics and a number of different graphs. So being able to list those out so we know exactly which um, analyses that we need to produce. So it's trying to get, what are the key pieces of information about our analysis that we need to understand? So just to give you a hand in breaking down an Excel analysis, because quite often either you'll have pre-established um, uh, Excel sheets with uh, you know, multiple workbooks in it, uh, with macros running, um, which might not have been written by yourselves. And so what you've got to do is go, go through and backwards engineer an Excel analysis in order to understand what needs to come out of it at the end, what you need to be writing into your R script. So when thinking about the analysis process, I'd recommend start with identifying the subject and the aim of the analysis. So work out what is it. So in our example, we're looking at, um, this is monthly reporting, and our aim is to report on the number of patients on the waiting lists for service X and the individual waiting times for the two teams that provide service X. What is our raw data input going to look like? And this is where you can go, is it consistent? Uh, am I going to have to, um, does it change sometimes? Uh, am I going to have to create a couple of different functions to account for those changes? Are those uh, differences in data input predictable or not. Then thinking about checking and cleaning the data, you know, this is something that takes a long time to do manually. And thinking about how you check and clean the data automate, in an automated way um, is, is absolutely invaluable in saving time, undertaking, going through line by line, having to put the filters on to check if all your categories are consistent, um, looking for inverse dates where they've been put in the wrong way around or um, incorrectly entered dates. Yeah, is, is, that's quite a heavy part of the process. Um, 
then you go through how, how are you going to need to transform the data? So, um, for example, splitting the data between the teams and can, in order to be able to conduct separate analyses on them. Um, whether you have to create any new columns of data. So, for example, you might have the um, uh, admission date and discharge date for patients, but you need to create the length of stay and calculate that. So that's part of the data transformation process. And then it's about analyze, then you need to go to analyzing the data. What are the analyses that we need to conduct? Visualizing that analysis, because that's all key to the communication element of it, and interpretation of the results. Um, because for any of the reporting that needs to be done, you need to be conveying what the uh, analysis does mean. And then absolutely essential is sense checking and verify everything throughout the analysis process. Um, so obviously, you know, that's something that you'd be doing anyway. But when you're creating generic scripts, you need to be really confident <laughs> in that they are producing the correct results every time. Um, and having little sense checks that you can use, um, you know, making sure that you've got your uh, the expected number of data points in there um, that are being put through the analysis when you're producing your descriptive statistics, you know, that can help you just check and make sure that the analysis is being performed correctly every time. So when we look at this, uh, the task for today, we can see that we're looking at uh, the, to get out the number of patients. We're looking to understand the waiting times for patients and between the two teams. The data extract that we've got, ID, age, referral date, treatment date, and the name to which the team has been referred. You know that there are data quality issues, so we've got to check for duplications, missing data, and incorrectly entered data. We're going to be building descriptive statistics tables and a number of graphs. And the the level of detail is going to be for the last two years. So um, we're looking at overall patient numbers, wait times, frequency of wait times, comparison of wait times by team, monthly comparison of wait times by team, and the monthly comparison of patient numbers by team. So these pieces of bold text tell us what um, our analysis process should look like and gives gives us an outline so your task should you choose to accept it is to put together this piece of code uh, to undertake exactly this analysis that we've uh, just discussed so i've been very kind and i have um written the code, the analysis script for you. And if you open up um, analysis script V1 modeled um, in our studio, and we'll have a look at that in a moment. So what you see when you open that is that there will be a number of text comments, which are um, have uh, given letters from uh, A down to uh, about O, I think. Um, and then underneath that are a number of code snippets, which are numbered 1 to 16. And your job is going to be to reorder those code excerpts to make a working script because they've been jumbled up. So the, the aim of this, depending on your, your level and familiarity with R, um, there are several different ways that you can go about doing this. You might want to start by taking the descriptions and ordering the descriptions correctly 
so that you understand what or in the order that you think that the analysis should be carried out and then try to match the codex to the description of what's happening or you can try matching the code to the description and then reordering them or if you want to make it really hard ignore the descriptions and just order the code excerpts but yes depending on your familiarity with R, um, you might want to um, you probably want to um, either match either order the descriptions first and then match the code to them or uh, match the code to the descriptions and then order them so when you're doing this, think about the analysis process that we just described and use this to help you to reconstruct the code because that code follows that analysis process. Um, yeah, as I said, each code excerpt has a corresponding description and the code excerpts are labeled with numbers and the descriptions are labeled with letters. So I'm just going to Oh, no, don't want that. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, so here we are. This is the, um, yes, this is uh, the analysis script V1 muddled. And when you open it, you'll see that there are these commented descriptions labeled A, B, C, D, and so on. And these are all, these are all muddled up. Um, but they describe each stage of the analysis process. And when we come down here, we've got the numbered um, code snippets and there's, they're numbered one to 16. So what I'm gonna do is split you into breakout rooms so that you can work in groups on this for about um, for about 30 minutes and the aim will be to um, try and reconstruct this and try and run the script and get it working so hopefully what this will do will give you an idea about kind of a, a standard analysis process for what is a fairly repeatable task taking a standard data set but also get you used to looking at our code and its structure and trying to pick apart what that code is doing um, you've got examples on in here of data import of um, working with dates which is uh, always a bit of a a fun one in R, um, doing data transformations, producing descriptive statistics, and producing graphs using ggplot. So there's a kind of uh, a lot of different um, skills, R skills that are demonstrated within the script, but hopefully it will give you a chance to see and, and to look at those, even if you're not that familiar with, with R. Um, and so I'll be dropping in and out of the breakout rooms um, to uh, see what's happening and how people are getting on and to, to lend a hand. Um, we ran this last year with paper, uh, did this as a paper exercise and, uh, and it worked quite well. I hope it works virtually for you. Um, so what I'm going to do is say we're at uh, 10 past 10 now so yeah if we give it uh, 30 minutes and I'll give you a five minute warning on when we're going to come back in um, so I'm going to allocate I'm going to stop sharing now and allocate everybody to some breakout rooms I'm going to pause recording as well as you do that. The time within your work, kind of the real practicalities of um, developing these kind of scripts and getting 
this going, um, you know, within your organization. And I think Zoe's, Zoe's a wealth of information on that. She's done such a fantastic job in doing that within her own organization and her experience is invaluable in that. So yeah, uh, uh, we'll, we'll turn over a bit of time to that chat at, at the cool. end of the session. Okay. Great, thank you. So- I just realized I was, I was being recorded then, wasn't I? No. Sorry? No. I was being recorded then, wasn't I? <laughs> no, I, I, I've recorded now. So no, your, your bits right. weren't recorded. Um, great, so um, I hope everybody seemed to be getting on really well with that task. And, um, you know, I hope everybody had a bit of fun doing it because it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big puzzle, um, you know, and that's the nice one. Code, coding is a puzzle in a way, you know, it's how you put it together and um, trying to find the ways that things things fit together best. Um, so I think that um, a lot of people will have got pretty much all the way there. So I'm going to run through the answers. If I remember to share my screen and we'll get this going. Right. Okay, so, right, so to run through, the first thing that we need to do when um, starting up our script is to initiate the libraries and bring those in. So here we've got our four libraries. So it's description P and code snippet 12. That's uh, very important in your library. So that's how we start. That's, that just means that we've got everything that we're gonna need um, imported and ready for use. Don't tend to space them out. They always go at the top of any script. And then next we're gonna read in our data. That's, uh, that's the next thing we need to do. And so that's F and four. Uh, so bringing in our data, we assign it to the variable data and it's just coming straight out of our working directory. Um, if you're running this and um, it's not able to import the data, it's because your working directory is pointing to the wrong place. Um, so you just need to set the working directly, directory correctly, um, which there's a couple of different ways to do, but if you're using our Studio Cloud, it should automatically use um, where you have the files, uh, as your working directory. The next thing, and this was interesting, this was um, a debate between quite a few groups, um, was trying to work out where the conversion of the dates go. Whenever you import data with date that uses dates, I recommend immediately converting your dates to date format. Um, then they're ready to be used. If you leave it till a bit later, okay, fine, but um, it's kind of just as good practice, get them converted into date formats. Um, R can't use dates in any other format. Um, so it, it just becomes uh, kind of unusable data until you've done the conversion. So that's E and 11. Then we go through and we start our data, uh, data cleansing. Uh, and data cleaning process. So we, uh, you can do this in a couple of different orders. So actually checking for missing data, um, typos and omissions, um, and checking for in incorrectly entered date stamps can occur in any order um, because one is not contingent on the other. So as long as you've got kind of L, L6, a16 and um, C9 um, and M2 following C9 in there in some order, that, that will be fine, that will work because they're just checks uh, that you're doing and you need to go in and actually manually um, potentially check or you know put, put in manual removals um, for some of the missing data or more specific um, rules for changing and removing that data. Um, when we get down to removing patients without team entries, 
which is a necessary thing to do because we require the team name data. Um, that has to occur or that should occur after you've done the other data cleaning. So this is where you, um, you change any data that needs to be changed within the data set and then you remove missing entries that need to be removed um, because you're trying to keep as much of the data as possible. Sorry, what was after uh, 16A? Uh, so, uh, and then the C, yeah, I've got C9. That's it, C9 there, so that's it. So it's checking for the incorrectly entered date stamps. And actually, uh, Zoe and I were talking and the, this, this is something that you shouldn't do, um, is actually swap incorrectly entered date stamps. They should be removed entirely, really. Um, but I put, put in the example here um, where they're being, where you've got negative dates, um, they're being swapped around. Um, but you can never guarantee that it's actually that the dates have been swapped. They may have just been entered incorrectly, so they should be removed from your data. So yeah, so we go C9, M2, then J13, removal of patients. And just to say, I will post these um, uh, corrected, the correct scripts up um, for you. So um, don't worry about trying to rush through and reorder everything as we're going through. Um, so now that we've finished the data cleaning, we can move on to transforming the data. Uh, and a term that I've learned is uh, data engineering. Um, so here we're looking at calculating the patient wait times. Um, <clears throat> so this is creating new data, um, creating a new column here, um, which is 08. And then we're going to subset this data by month. We want to subset everything by month because that's the time horizon that we're looking at is over two years and by month. So that's H7. And Can then, you just explain what's happening in that code in number seven, please? Could you just talk through it? Right. Okay. So we, we've got, first of all, we're using the minimum function to find the uh, minimum referral date, so the earliest date in our data set, then the max function to find the end date in uh, the highest, the most recent date in our data set. Then we're using the um, sequence um, function to create a sequence of months in fact, let me run the code so that we can actually see what's... Um, my working directory is still set. Um, yeah, so, um, so what we bring in is our start date, which is our earliest date, our end date, our most recent date and then so number of months is basically the length that so it's, it's counting the number of months we've got 24 months here um, and then we're creating the sweet sequence of months so that's the, the start of the months if you can see that there so these are dates and it's given the first of every month. Then we're going to create an em empty list for our month data and an empty list for our um, wait list. So here we're looking at what we're going to do is get the number of people waiting each month. So if I run this for loop here, what we get is so we've got month data, which is extracting. Uh, so this is basically, it's creating a data frame 
for each month to see how many people are in each um, on the waiting list every month. If that makes sense. So we're storing data frames in a list. And these essentially are the numbers of people of waiting um, that are on the waiting list every month. So we get our month data and our wait list, which again are data frames. And this is where we're calculating the wait time and the uh, which and the service that um, a person is in. So it's how long a person, each patient has been waiting and the team that they're waiting to see. So this is creating our raw data. Um, I, this is a real big data transformation here. So uh, let's see if I can pick this apart. So, yeah, we're just picking apart um, where the treatment date is after that the, we're basically trying to find out if they're still on the waiting list at this point. Um, so that the treatment date is after the current month and that the referral date is before the current month. And that's the way we're going out and we're grabbing the person, the person data and adding them to the um, to the month data list, and then the wait list is how long they've been waiting, and the team that specifically the wait time and the service that they're waiting for, because that's what we're going to use. Um, that's what we're being asked for in our analysis. So we then go down, and because we've got a list of data frames, we want to collapse that list of data frames into a single data frame. So we can use melt in order to be able to do that, which will basically, the melt function just um, concatenates, so stacks together data frames from a list in order. So if I run that, we can see that and drop levels out of it. We use the drop levels to remove the um, any un, any unused uh, levels from the data, so that we don't have um, spurious factor um, levels left. Um, so it's just the plain the plainest type of data that we can get. So if I go to DF weight here, just the weight data frame, we can see that we get service name so team two it's come from wait time we get the value the weight value and l1 and these are the this is it's created a variable to say which month it's coming from so month one month two and that's essentially each the data frame from each month month three going through So yeah, that's that's. Uh, it's not a tidy verse way of doing it, but this is how you do. Um, this is how you do this kind of uh, data manipulation, extraction, and transformation using base R. Um, it takes a little bit longer to learn this, uh, but it's it's quite a, it is a good way to be able to. Um, to work with base R to be able to really manipulate your data using index calls and simple functions. Um, so uh, moving on, so <laughs> after N5, we then get K14, which is um, where we're producing patient number uh, bar charts and descriptives. This is all the easy bit now. Um, because it doesn't matter what order you're doing these in, you can just go through and get um, all the different, uh, all of the different variations of descriptives and charts that you want. So uh, G10, patient numbers by team, bar chart and descriptives. 
I1 patient waiting times, box plot and descriptives by month. B3 patient waiting times, box plot and descriptives by team. D15 patient waiting times, box plot and descriptives by month and team. Um, which becomes kind of the, uh, the largest plot that you create. So hopefully that all makes sense and everybody's been able to see through that their own, you know, kind of their own logic and how they were working through that process. Um, so what you'll have noticed about that script um, is that a lot of it's there's specific calls to very specific indexes, use of names. Um, there's no user defined functions in there. Um, it's a non generic script. Um, it's made specifically to work with that data set in that instance. Now, what we're going to look at is uh, another version of this, and this time it's exactly the same code, exactly the same process, but made more generic um, and it uses some user defined functions and some slightly different ways of uh, writing the functionality in order to make it more um, reusable. So what I'd like you to do is to go through, um, I'm going to put you in, back into the breakout rooms, into the same groups, and that to uh, look at the analysis script V2 uh, modeled and to go through the same process, it should, it should hopefully be much easier this time, um, to get the, um, take the descriptions and the code and reorder them again, but look at the differences between the non-generic and this generic script and try and work out what you think the, the most important differences are. Oh, I hope we don't want that. <laughs> um, so go through, have a go, and afterwards we'll discuss the differences in the code and kind of that process, the changes that you start making as your script becomes more generic. And we'll also have a bit of a chat about how the practicalities of doing this in reality, and that'd be great. So, um, sorry, yes, any questions before we start? Able to post, uh, you, you said you'd put the correct order of the the last thing uh, that, that you'd pop that up. Um, yep. Um, where's going to be best to put that? Um, just just thinking. Um, can't post. I think I think we can probably put something in the file in the chat. So if yep. I work that out, I, I can put the slide because I think it's on your GitHub, is it? Yeah. So is, yeah. Am I able to? Um, I can pop the file into. Uh, just. Let me just see if I can get something in the chat. There was something else in the chat. I just lost my chat. Oh, yeah. Okay. I can send a file. That's great. I'll, um, okay. Right. Great. That's, um, that's in the chat now for everybody. Um, so that's the completed script. Um, and we'll try and, if we can try and get that on the cloud as well. Um, into the cloud project, that, that'll be great. But you'll be able to just open this on your computer anyway, even if it's just in Notepad or something like that, that you'll be able to see the, uh, the order in which things were done. Um, excellent. And yeah, I'll pop you into your breakout rooms. And again, I'll come around, we'll- Okay, right. off the record. Uh, we might want to go off. Okay. Cheers, Amy. So, um, I hope, I'm sorry, I didn't make it round to all the groups there, but, um, uh, but I hope that um, after the first task, 
that one kind of was maybe a little bit more fun, um, if fun's the right word. Um, what I'm going to do now is just put a few um, resources as um, this was something we were discussing. I'm just going to put a few resources up for everybody, um, which uh, is a website that first one's a website that I've developed called rforhealthcare.org. And this has uh, this goes through and gives you a um, uh, basically a step through of all the basic um, R functionality goes through all the basic functionality and according all the way from data types, data structures, um, how you deal with um, uh, how how do you, how you deal with um, things like creating new unique values, understanding array sizing. Um, it's all the kind of stuff to get you thinking in that real programming way of uh, way of thinking, you know, and um, kind of giving you the tools to really go, go for that. Um, and the other one that I'm going to post up are, um, we run something called, uh, my group runs something called the Health Service Modeling Associates program. And this is uh, just in the southwest at the moment, but it is um, we we work with health analysts, uh, healthcare analysts, taking them through a three month training program, and then a nine month mentoring program. Um, and the we've got one hundred and two hours of content, um, and it goes through everything from the basics of programming um and it, but it's programming in python um and yeah the I'll, I'll put the uh, put the links up on the github repo for you yeah that's a good good idea um but yeah we go all the way through um the basics of programming all the way through to um things like deep learning um looking at uh, simulation modeling on on the way and so, you know, things to check out and have a look at. Um, and yeah, just useful. Uh, uh, later this month, I'll be doing one on R. So there will be a, a video going up of uh, me going through the um, R for healthcare training materials. Um, and then in December, there'll be an advanced one where I'll be looking at um, distribution fitting ggplot and shiny and developing a distribution fitting app um, as as the output of that okay so let's get started on having a look at the answers from um, from the second one just um, share my screen okay so so this is a script that is doing exactly the same thing as we did previously, but it's just written in a slightly more um, uh, generic manner. Um, it's not entirely generic, and there are ch ch things that can be improved in it to make it more generic, but uh, it's kind of the next step after your non-generic script, you know, um, is how you start making things much more generic. So again, uh, so we start B7 and bring in our input, our libraries. Hopefully everybody got that one. And also the next one, C13, data, we read in our data. Next um, is G and two. And here, this is a little bit of an extra one that what we're doing is getting a list of the, um, of the, uh, data names, uh, the column names, and which are the, um, what the structure of that data is to identify which columns we need to convert to a date format. Then we have I-15, which is the conversion of the date. Now, you know, these are um, 
user defined functions. We can see that by the uh, function call here. And they take their inputs, which um, in this instance there's two data and columns, calls, um, and they return something. They return, in this instance, it's a uh, data frame. It's our data variable. And so we input our data and we're saying that we want to convert columns three and four to date format. And that's what that function is doing. Next, we have F3, which is a function to uh, check where there might be missing data points. And in fact, I'm sorry, I should be going through and running this because um, it's good because what I've also included in here is um, some feedback in the console, which says the data, the structure of the data is as follows. Um, any dates will need to be converted from factor to date format. So we can see that our referral date and our treatment date are both factors, but they need to be converted to date format. And when we do our date, we do our date conversion. And it says date, uh, data column three is converted to date format and data column four is converted to date format. And this is actually really helpful when other people are using your script because it allows them to see what is happening within the code. So providing that kind of feedback is, is very, very useful. And also good commenting because um, when you haven't used a uh, piece of code for a while, it's good to know what's happening in the in the code, and you do it is easy to forget. So then we're checking the data for anything that's missing, and it returns saying in column four there are 114 missing data points. So at least that gives us an indication in this instance of something that we need to do something about that. Next, checking for category typos, emissions, and duplications. So that's K9. Um, and so the typo check. Um, first of all, uh, it tells us there are uh, 2,390 unique entries in column one, 36 unique entries in column two, and three unique entries in column five. So these are things that we need to no, okay, how many are, am I expecting? And then we're going to do a duplication check. And this returns the rows with duplicated IDs are. And so this then shows us where we have duplicated IDs and that we need to remove any duplications if they're not correct or that's something that we need to go away and check what's happening with that data. So then M11 is the next bit. We're looking for the incorrectly entered date stamps. And it comes back and tells us that we've got negative dates in um, here in, of 45 days, 43 days, and 34 days. Um, so we're going to swap are incorrectly entered date stamps, which is something that you shouldn't actually do. <laughs> um, so it tells then feeds back and tells us what's been changed. And then H and one is the emission removal where we've got missing data. And so it removes the following day, uh, following rows. And then E18, we're going to calculate our patient wait times now that our data cleaning is finished. And so we've got a column that's been added. Let's put that the wait time column has been added to the data frame data clean. And then we're going to start developing our, then we get our descriptives and our, I run the rest of it because the order's not, oh no, no, we've got to, so we do um, Q12, which is generate the wait time descriptives and histogram. 
and then we subset the wait time data by month. Uh, it's A17. And then we do our uh, melt, um, where we bring the multi, uh, converting our data, uh, list of data frames into a single multi level data frame. Uh, so that's D and five. And then after that, we uh, do the uh, graph development, graph and output into graphs and uh, descriptives. Okay. So, and um, this time the um, the graphs, I believe, yeah, they're uh, output and saved as um, JPEG files. So there's even that uh, example of how you how that's working in here. Now I'm just wondering. Oh yeah, it is in here. That's uh, that's great. So. Can see examples of our these are the graphs that are being produced okay so um oh, i'm going to go back to um the slides okay So um, just to open things up, um, in fact, actually, we're running a bit short on time. So the main differences between those two scripts there, they were, um, they were performing exactly the same or pretty much the same functions, except from one, it was a bit more helpful than the other. Um, you know, one's, ah, it's just the code, and, but the other one is trying to be more generic and more useful um, and provide feedback to the user um, of the program. So it makes use of user-defined functions. Um, it's a great way to um, split up your code and make reusable pieces of reusable functions that you can put in and, and use in other instances that you pass in a data frame in, you're doing something to it and you're getting uh, something else, something out on the other side. Um, there are uh, the calls, direct calls to specific columns or rows have been removed. Um, you're trying to use um, either user input or um, kind of different different techniques to identify which are the rows that or columns that should be used and should be changed. Um, removing specific value entries where possible. Um, so it's kind of trying to automate the identification of such values. Um, standardizing the shape of the input data. Um, uh, to make the uh, to make the script flexible, and adding feedback and checks and warnings to aid the user, um, just so that they can see what's happening and what might be going wrong. Um, because yeah, uh, sometimes somebody's put the wrong data in, or there's um, there's a value that you haven't um, accounted for. You know, somebody's put a categorical variable in the date um, column. You know, which can really mess you up, um, and you've got to go through and find those. So, just kind of concluding and um, thinking about um, tasks for automation, and you know, why why is it um, that we're doing this? Well, it's a lot of it's about transparency and this rep, uh, reproducibility um, that. If you're doing something in Excel, there it relies on manual manipulation of the data all the way through. There's no uh, transparency in the process that you've used to create that data um, and to create and to undertake the analysis. Um, 
and then it's difficult for somebody else to reproduce you know i'm sure you've many of you trained people um in doing develop you know, actually um creating reports and taking over from somebody else or taking over from yourself on um, creating a report and you've got to go through and show them the whole process well if you can go okay here's my script for doing this i've commented it so it explains all the processes it gives you feedback let me know if there's anything um, that you don't understand in it you know that's that's a much easier handover process than having to spend half a day sat down with somebody going through an analysis where they've got to take reams of notes to understand where they're clicking and what they're doing. Um, yeah, we, we were having a discussion in one of the groups, you know, uh, where, you know, talking about these kind of why, why is it important to be um, moving away from Excel and towards R? You know, Excel was not des designed for um, large scale data analysis. It's a piece of accounting software, really. Um, and it's it's not designed and developed to undertake um, you know real scientific analyses. Um, even the range of graphs it produces is very limited. Um, producing histograms is difficult, as is uh, box plots, um, which are the types of graphs that you really need to be producing to demonstrate variability and understand the shapes of shape of your data. And what's happening the ranges that you're seeing as we know, all know how important variability is in determining system function in the nhs um, as soon as you get there's so much variability that it really can throw systems out of whack where the average looks good but yeah so with um with this uh kind of this talk and you know kind of these scripts that you're seeing and the aim of this is just to try and get this, picking a simple, useful, well-defined task to that's regularly conducted with consistently shaped data extract and consistent analysis and trying to automate it and just giving it a go. Um, yeah, using um, and the resources that are available, the things that you'll learn through this conference with the workshops and the conference talks next week. Have a look at the r4healthcare.org uh, website. Um, that will help you think about, you know, some of the real basics around how you're constructing your program. And have a go. It's just have a go. Um, you know, uh, write out your process, first of all, about how you're analysis is needs to be undertaken you know what what steps you think you have to go through and then try and reproduce that um, and basically you know go through identify the subject and the aim of the analysis work out you know what's your raw data what's being input what are your column headers what's your shape of your data checking what the checks and the clean cleaning that needs to be done transformation how are you transforming the data and then the easy bit the analysis and visualization that's the fun bit and the easy bit at the end um and then you know it, it can give you more time to interpret the results i think that's something that um analysts aren't asked enough to do they often pass a, a simple report onto the management or pass the data on to uh, the the analysis the graphs and the and the tables onto somebody else who then interprets it but actually you're the person that's working with the data if you've got more if you're spending less time undertaking manual analyses you can actually input a lot more into, into the interpretation of the results because you're the person it works with and understands the data um, and just remember to sense check and verify everything throughout the uh, the analysis process so when writing, trying to write one of these programs, yeah, start with the non-generic script. Um, you know, that kind of first one that we saw, you know, just write it, get it to do it, hack it together. That's what we do with hack, go together. Get it to do what you want it to do. Then you do another iteration of the program um, and make it more generic and clean it up and make it simpler. And then, and it will, it will evolve. It will change over time. 
that's you know that's part of this you know programs aren't meant to be static and the more that you share them other people will change them and uh, you know, they, they might have a really good idea oh hang on, you can use this function to remove these lines of code or we can make this more generic by um, checking that uh, you know uh, for uh, particular errors that might be coming up um, things like uh, try and accept statements we haven't covered here but um, that, that you can get the program to try things and if it doesn't work it will give you it will do one thing um, you know or throw an error um, but then you can change it you, the user can um, make a change to the input that they're giving um, comment your script well that that is uh, absolutely necessary in terms of understanding what is happening in the script and for, not just for others but uh, for yourself as well when you haven't looked at it in a um, in a month or two and you go ah what was that doing um share and reuse your script um you know it's all about you know transparency reproducibility um and yeah helping each other out you know uh, programming is is a community um with everybody helping each other out um you know everybody's probably using stack overflow um and all of the you know our bloggers and all, all of the different um, resources that are out there there's a lot out there to help you um, and most of all keep on learning and have fun while doing it because it is it's a constant learning process um, I'm, I'm continuously continuously learning um, and uh, yeah I don't think that will ever stop in this uh, in this game uh, computer computer science data science um, is the fastest growing um, type of knowledge that we have at the moment and and it's gonna that's not gonna slow down I don't think so I'm getting quite close to half past just to let yeah, you know. a few people have you. to go because of meetings yeah thank you and yeah and thank you and, uh, and and I hope you had fun um, yeah um, check out Alpha Healthcare I will post um, the links for the HSMA material up on um, uh, up on the github page and yeah uh, just have fun enjoy and uh happy to take any questions you know af after this even you know i'm i'm on the nhsr slack workspace so i'll be there you can always get hold of me on there thank you and i can stop recording so